the symphony in 1538. Next to the word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. Music controls our thoughts, minds, hearts, and spirits. The precious gift of music has been given to man alone that he might remind himself that God has created man for the purpose of praising God. A person who does not regard music as a marvelous creation of God must be a clodhopper indeed and does not deserve to be called a human being. <laughs> 1538. Music for Luther was a powerful proclamation of the good news. Many will visit our worship services today among churches of Christ for the very first time they'll ask you, where's your music? Why don't you have music? And what they have in mind is instrumental music, but music involves more. Music is vocal or instrumental sounds having rhythm, melody, or harmony. Vocal music is made with a human vocal system created in man by God. It is a system that is capable of speaking and singing, and the degree of musical ability among people varies. We know that there are those that have more ability to sing than others, and yet we still need to use the vocal system that God has given us, that he has created in us. When you think about the voice, the voice is the real thing. Instruments imitate the human voice. When I think about my years of playing in the band, about 10 years of that, and I think about the instruments that surrounded me in the band room or in a concert hall, there were instruments that were designed to sound in the range of a soprano voice or alto, tenor, bass. But when I think about what God has given us, he's given us a voice that we can use it. We're going to talk more about that as we look at the real instrument that we all have been given as well. The Lord commanded his people to worship him with music. In Psalm 30 and verse 4, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Let's join in. God is love. Here's the one I'm referring to, or that's being referred to here. Kenaniah, 
leader of the Levites, was instructor in charge of the music. Why? Because he was skillful. In verse 27, David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who bore the ark, the singers, and Kenaniah, the music master with the singers. The music master. Yeah, that's what they did in Old Testament times. They were authorized to do that. But when we look at New Testament times in which we live, we are to sing and make melody in our hearts to God. When reference is made to, the, to singing and making melody in the heart, God stated what the instrument is. It is the heart. When you think about the heart of man, the heart of man involves his ability to think and reason, understand, and believe. And it also involves his ability to trust, hope, love, and rejoice. We're talking about the intellect. This is really the instrument, is the heart. And the human heart is an instrument for everyone. I'm not talking about the blood pumping vessel right here. I'm talking about what's going on up here between our ears. What's going on? God knows what's going on. He searches all hearts. But it's a hum the human heart is an instrument for everyone, and every child of God can strike the strings of his own heart. I believe he's referring here to our attitude. What's going on with our attitude? Most members of the body of Christ are familiar with these two passages, Colossians 3, 16, and Ephesians 5, and verse 19, that we are commanded to sing. And we're going to look at this in more depth as we look at the context of Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5. We're going to look at who sings. And to whom do they sing? When to sing? Why? We are to sing. And what are we to sing? And then we'll close out with how to sing. Who sings? The righteous do. In Proverbs 29 and verse 6, the righteous sings and rejoices. The righteous are those who are in good standing with God, who have a, a good relationship with Him. And when I think about it in Colossians 3, if you look at verse 12, what these people who are told to sing with grace in their hearts are referred to as the elect of God, called in one body. These are people who are in a relationship with God, who are in good standing with Him, who have obeyed His will. But over in Ephesians 5, when this was addressed to the church at Ephesus, who were to sing and make melody in their heart, they are told, be imitators of God as dear children. Children who are in a relationship with their father, who are in the right relationship with God. They are among the righteous. When we think about singing praises to God, it's an old practice among God's people. Way before the church was ever, ever established on the day of Pentecost, we can go back and look in the Old Testament of God's righteous people who were to sing songs of victory and sometimes lamentations of defeat. We look in Exodus 15 at Moses and Israel after they had crossed the, 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 the sea and after they had been in bondage for over 400 years. What were they doing when they crossed over? We can find that they sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength in song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Then you think of David. David, a man after God's own heart. He wrote many of the Psalms, and here's what he said. One of the things he said about praising God, Psalm 108, verse 3, I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples, and I will sing praises to you among the nations. And then we move over to the New Testament. We read of Jesus and the apostles together in the upper room when the Lord's Supper was instituted at the conclusion of that assembly when they had sung a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. And then we can look in Acts 16 at the apostle Paul when Paul and Silas were falsely accused 
and beat with many stripes, were thrown into prison. And what do we find them doing at midnight? They were praying and singing hymns to God. They weren't complaining. They weren't complaining. They were singing and praising, praying to God. And, and when I think about the conversion of the Philippian jailer, do you think maybe this might have had something to do with his conversion? I don't know. But I do know this. The prisoners were listening to them. And no doubt that made an impression upon them, as I believe it would to anyone. So who sings? The righteous do. But to whom do they sing? As we go back to Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5, to the Lord. They sing to the Lord. Not to each other, but they sing to God. Too often people sing songs of praise in worship without any feeling behind what they're saying. I'm guilty. It's happened to me. I've gone through psalm services and thought about it later. I thought, you know, I didn't really get anything out of that psalm service. And then I start thinking about it and thinking, well, whose fault is that? I'll let things distract me. I didn't put anything into it. But I think what we've got to realize, it's not because the lyrics and the music sound pretty to my ear, to the worshiper, but first songs must be directed toward God as though he is the audience, because he knows our hearts. He knows what's going on with each one of us. He knows if his child is singing what he means and means what he sings. Children of God must sing as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. He is creator of heaven and earth and all things therein. He is worthy of praise, not empty flattery. Worthy art thou.
singing a few songs. And then he went on to say, and why not do some of the songs that our children love, that they have learned to know and love to sing. And so we were going on to sing one or two songs. We ended up singing, what, eight or nine or ten? We sang songs like, the battle belongs to the Lord. And to hear those young voices singing along and just carrying all of us who were older through it. And then to sing, Awesome God, or I Stand in Awe, or How Great Thou Art. Blessed Assurance. We sang some of the old and newer songs. But I'm glad that our children are part of that. And they need to see that and hear that in their parents and grandparents. When I think about James 5 and verse 13, it is believed that that is of individual application. When James says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. And we can do that anywhere, anytime. Even on the lake when we're fishing. My father and I would go fishing and we would be out on the lake. And he, he being a songwriter and a song leader and a teacher, we, we, we sang all the time. I remember as we were growing up, fondest memories I have of growing up is traveling down the highway with my dad and mother and my brother and my sister. And my dad said, all right, get the songbooks out. We had books under the seat of the car. And we all get a songbook out. We're singing from our books, and he's got his on the steering wheel. And we're singing along. And, and we somehow we survived. <laughs> and there was not a seat belt in the cars back then. Some great memories. Great memories. But when do the righteous sing? Every time they come together. These brethren in Colossae and Ephesians were told to admonish one another, to speak to one another. And, and when would they be doing that? I believe when they came together. You know, there's something that we read in Psalm 34. The psalmist said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let's do it when we come together. And, and when we look, look at this song here, when I think about the passage underneath that title from Matthew 18, verse 20, what do we, what do we read that, that Jesus said? How, how, how we note that in, in the New Testament it emphasizes togetherness. And he taught this. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And the presence of Jesus does not depend on the size of those who have gathered, but that the gathering together is in his name. Love 
which are in Christ Jesus. But why do the righteous sin? Why? Because God said so. Do we need to comment a lot on that? When God says to do something, do it. Years ago, I was traveling up toward Albuquerque. We lived in New Mexico for a number of years. And I was driving up to Albuquerque one day, and I saw a billboard that said, said God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I got a lot of mileage out of that for several years. I would go around, and I would talk about this lesson, and I'd say, well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And then someone came up to me one day and said, that's not really correct. I said, what do you mean it's not correct? He said, God said it, that settles it. And it's up to me whether or not I want to believe it and follow it or not. The church at Ephesus was told and instructed to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. The brethren at Colossae were told to sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And this is a direct command as important as any. And if a child of God refuses to teach and admonish those around him, He's guilty of disobedience. I think we need to think about that more. I, I mean, when I have stressed so much about singing, and I think all of us have, and we've used these two passages to show the importance of this to our friends, we need to sort of back it up a little bit and say, all right, before we get to the singing part, what else are we doing when we come together? We are teaching and admonishing one another. My goodness, that passage is filled with so much to help us this area of our worship. Singing praises in worship is an opportunity, a privilege, a privilege that we have to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God to praise Him. In Hebrews 13 and verse 15, the Hebrew writer said, Therefore by Him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. And it's to be done the best we know how. I mean, I believe that this week that we have spent together, it's obvious to me that you care about this and that you want to improve in this. Why? Because you want to offer God your best. I mean, when you think back to the Old Testament times, those who offered animal sacrifices to God under the law of Moses, they were to be without blemish. That's what God accepted. And so when it comes to our worship, singing and praying and partaking for supper and, and all that we do in our worship, give your best. And I believe you need to say to the, your leaders, your shepherds here, thank you. Thank you. Whether it's me coming in or someone else, that has the ability to do what, what I'm, I've done with you, it, it's not about me. This is all about pleasing God. Be grateful to those that are leading you in this congregation to improve in this area, to give your best. What an opportunity we have to not only praise God and glorify Him, but to encourage one another. And when I think about what this does, First of all, God is glorified. And second of all, we benefit from it, don't we? Because we're edified. He is in our midst.
those songs. And all those words, although they are synonyms, there's a little bit difference in their meaning. Let me just go through them. Psalms are songs of praise. Like the Psalms of David. And there are songs that we have been singing through the years. I don't hear them too much anymore, but there are variations from the Psalms. Like if you think about the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Different variations, different arrangements of that song. There's another one we used to sing when I was growing up. The heavens declare the glory of God. Those are songs that we that we sing. Psalms of praise. What about hymns? They're songs of praise too. And thanksgiving. But that would include those that have been written by people, by man, men, women, who are uninspired. But as long as they are in harmony with God's will, they are songs that we use, that we must continue using. When I think about spiritual songs, these include psalms and hymns, but the expression emphasizes the importance of heart motivation. Yeah, we, we need to show some emotion when we sing, and not just be sort of dead throughout. Not sort of. We don't want to be dead. We want to be alive. And, and we need to express that when we're those of us who are leading God's people in worship and those who are following the one who's leading us. But when I think about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, they are addressed to God, first of all, addressed to God that praised Him. They are songs that are addressed to others that praise God. And they're in harmony with the Spirit of God. So I, I really believe that those who are among the righteous we need to step back and look at this and say, thank you, God, for telling us for what kind of songs to use. That we, don't, we don't have someone getting up in here to lead us and lead us in some song that we have heard on the radio. I mean, a song that was very popular years ago was Country Roads by John Denver. Some of us who wrote her, we remember that. We memorized it. But I never heard anyone ever bring that into the assembly. I'm glad that we were able to sing that at home or around other people and and, uh, and those of us that used to get together uh, and, and do that. Or row, row your boat. Never heard that in the assembly. But we have, we should be grateful for what God has told us. What kind of songs to use? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And they are songs primarily directed to Him. And He deserves them. He's the one who created us. He deserves everything that we can give Him. And then how? How are the righteous to sing? I pointed out earlier, they must have the right attitude. Here they're told to sing with grace in their hearts. Sing and make melody in your heart. Sing with faith. Sing with love. Sing with joy. Thank you. 
their attitude toward God. And the Lord must have noticed that. Maybe a lack of interest in worshiping Him in song. And then you go over to Revelation chapter 3, and we read of the church at Laodicea who were indifferent. And the Lord said, Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. He must have noticed something in their worship, in their singing or lack of. The heart cannot afford to be out of tune with God's will. You know, you may not be able to get your voice in tune, and some of you have said, I just don't have the uh, the voice I used to have. I, I think we just, as we get older, we, we, we can look back and say, you know, I used to be able to hit those higher notes a lot easier than I can now. I don't work at it as much as I did when I was going through school and all that. But I know one thing you can improve, and that's your attitude, your heart. Just remember that, your heart. We can do something about that. And, and when I've had people come up to me in, in places, it, it hasn't happened here. I hope it doesn't. I still have till tomorrow. We leave tomorrow. But people have come up to me and said, I just want you to know, if you don't see me singing, it, it's because I just can't sing. And, and I, I used to say, well, I understand. I understand. And then I begin to think about this. Who am I to give anybody <laughs> time off or get out of jail free card? <laughs> like, okay, that you're, that you're okay. No, it's not me. You, you take that up with God. You think about that when you communicate with Him in prayer and when you communicate with Him through song. Let me close this out. In 1 Corinthians 14 and 15, I know this is in regards to spiritual gifts, but Paul told the Corinthian brethren, I will pray with the Spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. Here in one verse we find pray and sing. Pray with the Spirit. Pray with the understanding. Sing with the Spirit and sing with the understanding. When we pray, I think many times we show much more reverence in that area than we do in singing. We bow our heads. Years ago, I remember my grandfather and others, Dickie's grandfather, would get down on their knee during a prayer in the assembly not that they were trying to show off to anybody around them, but they just they, they just they came before the throne of God and, and with reverence when it came to praying. And yet singing is something like, well, it's just singing. Now, what are we going to do tonight? We're, we're going to sing. Just, oh, well, it's just singing. I've never heard anyone ever say, well, it's just praying. No, it, it, all of this is important, directed toward God. And then again, think about what Paul and Silas were doing in that prison that night. In one verse right here, they were praying and singing hymns to God. To whom? To God. They were among the righteous, and that's what the righteous